Hello, my friends. In this video, we'll be looking at the autosomal DNA results of Zana of Abkhazia. But first, let's read a little bit of the story about this woman, about Zana. So, Zana was initially believed to have been a member of the Afro Abkhazian people who lived in the Caucasus in the late 1800s. Let me zoom in a little bit so that you can see this better, see this text better. Uh, Abkhazia is located right here in the northwest of Georgia. I actually traveled there myself when I was a kid. I've been to Abkhazia and it was really pleasant. I did not see any black people there, but uh, historically black people did inhabit Abkhazia a little bit, this region right here of northwestern Georgia. Known as the African Caucasians, the Abkhazians of African descent lived in and near the settlement of Ab Adjibur, I can't pronounce that, Ad Adjibur, I don't know, on the east coast of the Black Sea. The photo of the African Abkhazian families from the Caucasus, Volume 1. The peoples of the Caucasus, St. Petersburg, Kavalevsky, PI, 1914. Very interesting pho photograph. So here you can see uh, there's some uh, black people wearing traditional Caucasian, uh, Caucasian style clothing. It is uncertain how this group of African people came to this region, but they seem to have arrived when the region was under the rule of the Ottoman Empire. So these black people came to the Caucasus, to Abkhazia. Uh, most likely during the Ottoman Empire period. Uh, now let's talk about the Zana, Zana story. Zana was reportedly living wild and naked in the forest in the Caucasus region. These mountains had long been rumored to hold creatures similar to Bigfoot called Almasti in Russia. The story goes that a traveling noble merchant, possibly Eg Egdgi Genaba, I don't know who that is, heard about an ape woman living in the forest and paid the local men to capture this poor creature sometime between 1850 and 1870. The locals forced her in into a spike-lined pit. That is, that is, that is horrible. Like, um, it's, it's a, it's a human, uh, it's a human woman, right? And they forced her into this. What they did later is even worse. Hold on, let me read through the whole thing, because this is ridiculous. The nobleman paid the man, named his captive Zana, shackled her, took her home, and enclosed Zana in a cage where she dug a hole in which to sleep. That is, that's something that could only have happened in the 19th century, to be honest. Like, I can't imagine something like this. I can't, I can't imagine in 21st century somebody treating uh, a woman this way. I, I mean, I can't, I don't know. That's ridiculous. A slightly different version of the story says that Zana was sold from the man to man until Genaba bought her. Okay. Zana was apparently covered in thick red hair, powerfully muscular, and at 6 feet 6 inches in height, towering over the local residents. When given clothes, she repeatedly would shred them. Okay. Genaba charged people who would come and gawk at the naked, caged cape woman, ape woman, who could not or did not speak. So what I think is that most likely she had some kind of disability, right? So if she's out there and she's naked and she doesn't want to put on clothing, she's probably just really severely mentally ill. Uh, maybe she has some kind of psychosis or something like that. But uh, obvi obviously, if, like human women are capable of speech, right? So the fact that she's not speaking says something about her mental health. And it doesn't mean she's an ape, right? Zana did not try to escape, and eventually she was granted some repetitive reprieve by only being chained to a fence. Horrible. Eventually, Zana was taught to do chores and, in essence, became a servant. She was also provided with alcohol. The local men repeatedly raped Zana while she was drunk. Like, this is so deranged. This really tells you that they did not really think it's an ape, because would you, would you rape an ape? Obviously not. So they, they viewed her as a human. Because they raped her. That's the evidence of them viewing her as a human. But nonetheless, they still chained her. They still treated her so horribly. So this is just, this is just like awful to read. Zana reportedly had a total of six children by unknown local men. Although unknown, that's oh she that doesn't even know the dads of these children. Although only four can be relatively assured and two proven. Zana apparently took the first two babies to a river to wash them. But the children died. So yeah, I, I think she might have had some kind of a mental health condition where uh, she doesn't really, she's kind of disconnected from reality, doesn't know what she's doing. So I'm thinking she might be just uh, psychotic or something like that. 
After that, the local woman took the following four children away from Zana to protect them, since apparently she didn't understand how to care for an infant. Uh, not one of her children is actually also on my computer. Not one of her children. I'm, al I'm also going to be making a video about it's Khvid. So expect a video on Khvid in the following day, maybe tomorrow, maybe after tomorrow. Uh, let's continue reading this. None of Zana's children had her thick hair. They all spoke normally and had families. Pictures remain of her two children. Uh, daughter Korjanar and son Khvit. So Khvit, you're gonna see. You can see photos of Korjanar, Khvit, and Khvit's children here in a supplement page. Let's let's look at them actually. Hold on, let's see. Uh, Korjanar and Khvit. Let's look at them. Look, let's, let's look at these photos. Okay. Uh, Zana's descendants. Top panel. Korjanar and Khvit. Right. So let's let's see. What do they look like? Kojanar and Khvit. They kind of look normal. You know, they look... Um, yeah, I mean... They, they look pretty normal. Khvit is kind of like... Um, a little bit scary looking. I don't see anything... I don't see anything ape in, in their appearance, to be honest. I don't see anything ape... Uh, any, like, ape-like traits in their appearance. They both look just like regular black people to me. So... Yeah, let's see what she scores. Let's go ahead and see what she scores with my uh, trade predictor. We're going to start with the haplogroup section. So she is a female, uh, but she is actually scoring a male haplogroup. The reason she's scoring a male haplogroup because technically she does have some variants for F and then R uh, in her in her file. But of course, there's, uh, there's also one thing that matters for my trade predictor is the gender score, which is calculated by uh, looking at the proportion of uh, of uh, readable and legitimate uh, calls on the Y chromosome relative to the quality of the file. So based on that proportion, she is most definitely a female. She does not really have a Y chromosome, uh, and we can disregard the haplogroup that was predicted for her. So she's definitely a female. Let's go ahead and see what she scores for the ethnic calculator results. This might be quite interesting to see. And here she is closest to Clint Chimpanzee, followed by Oko the Gorilla. Um, but that's that, that's kind of typical. Uh, like if you're a sub-Saharan African, you can you might actually score closest to chimp and gorilla with my calculator. So that's that's nothing surprising. Followed by that is Shamlaka from Africa. Followed by that is African American. Followed by that is South African hunter gatherer. Then Mota Ethiopian hunter gatherer. So Mota is a, a ancient individual from Ethiopia, also very sub-Saharan African in ancestry. Then Shamlaka. Uh, from a Stone Age, then Hoi San Hunter Gatherer, then African American one, then Vindija Neanderthal. So she's kind of re very black in her result. Uh, with the Oracle, she's getting mono as a mixture of African American two plus Shamlaka. I think African American two is the slightly more European one, uh, whereas African American one is the slightly more uh, Sub Saharan African one. She's also getting mono as a mixture of African American two plus Oko the Gorilla, uh, African American two plus South African Hunter Gatherer. Uh, African American 2 plus Clint Chimpanzee. Then there's also Clint Chimpanzee plus Clint Chimpanzee, also very interesting. So we can clearly see that she's very uh, sub Saharan African in her result, right? And this was done on the basis of 592 SNPs. Let's go ahead and move on to her Nashakot results. Let's see what she looked like. Uh, so for Nashakot results, it looks like she's got darkest brown eyes, definitely very dark eye color. 96% likelihood of darkest brown eyes. Uh, any other uh, eye color is extremely, extremely improbable for her. It looks like she's got 100% likelihood of black hair. So any hair color besides black would be extremely, extremely improbable for her. It did say in the article. Uh, in the article, it said she had red hair. So that's kind of surprising how she, how she supposedly had red hair while the oracle is predicting her to have black hair. And she also definitely has very dark brown skin. 99% likelihood of dark brown skin. So she's quite dark brown skin, black hair, and darkest brown eyes. What about the hair texture? Hair texture, 99% likelihood of kinky hair. So she definitely has kinky hair as well. So she's got kinky hair. She's got dark brown skin. She's got black hair. And she's got darkest brown eyes. Who does this remind you of? Who does this remind you of? This reminds me of a certain group of people. So she does not have blue eye haplotype 3 or blue eye haplotype 2 or blue eye haplotype 1. She doesn't really have any of the blue eye haplotypes. 
but she does have one light color variant in this variation of MC1R, which is kind of surprising. So she actually has a variant in MC1R that predisposes her to having um, ginger hair, which is kind of uh, really, really, really interesting. She also has one that variant in this variation of IRF4, which is also kind of surprising. So two variants that predispose to ginger hair, but uh, still, still their likelihood of red hair is still 0 0.00001 0 percent. So definitely doesn't have red hair. Let's see the phenotype oracle real quick. <laughs> Let's see what phenotypes she matches most close to. So the phenotypes she's most close to are this, which is kind of like a South Indian phenotype, followed by this, which is a East African phenotype, followed by this, which is a I don't even know what kind of phenotype this is. This is just really like weird, like maybe Southeast Asia. Not sure. Uh, and let's look at the um, let's look at the oracle. So with the oracle, the closest mixtures to her are a mixture of 50% this plus 50% this. So this really dark looking nilotic kind of phenotype plus this. Uh, the second closest mixture is 50% this plus 50% this. This is like a really dark looking uh, West African phenotype plus Indian. Then uh, this plus this. So like East African Somali plus Indian. Uh, then fourth place comes this phenotype mixture, which is um, West African or like Bantu plus Indian once again. And last place uh, out of the closest mixtures, fifth place in the closest mixtures, 50% this, like Nilotic dark person plus 50% uh, South Asian. Very interesting for sure. There is no pictures of, um, there is no pictures of uh, Zana out there. But there are pictures of Hvit, and we're going to look at Hvit's results tomorrow. So tomorrow you're going to see, well, maybe tomorrow, maybe after tomorrow, I'm not sure. But soon you're going to see what Hvit scores as well. Um, and he's quite a lot whiter than his mom. Let's go ahead and see what she scores for the biomarkers real quick. So for the biomarkers, she scores higher than average levels of vitamin D, higher than average, average levels of LDL cholesterol, below average levels of HDL cholesterol, uh, slightly above average levels of glucose, slightly above average levels of hemoglobin, below average blood pressure, slightly below average level of iron in the blood, slightly below average level of sex hormone binding globulin in blood, and slightly below average level of red blood cell count in blood. So pretty typical stuff. Nothing here is too surprising. I do want to see the mental health results and the polygenic risk scores because I feel like uh, her strange behavior could be explained by a mental illness rather than um you know being an ape obviously so for leukemia she scores below average odds for leukemia she scores high for vitiligo she scores average for myopia she scores high for primary biliary cirrhosis she scores average for stroke she scores very low for male pattern hair loss okay so she's definitely not predisposed to any kind of male pattern hair loss definitely very cool this might be among the, the least, uh, the lowest scores I've seen for male pattern hair loss, actually. She's got a slightly below average score for atrial fibrillation. She's got a very high score for deep vein thrombosis. Very, very high score for DVT. Uh, she's also got a moderately high score for bipolar type 1 and a moderately high score for schizophrenia. Uh, could she have, could she have had um, bipolar or schizophrenia? I think, yes, it's very likely. It's very likely from her behavior that she had bipolar type 1 or schizophrenia. It's, it's, it's uh, not bipolar type 2 because that's completely different. But bipolar type 1 or schizophrenia, it's very possible from her behavior uh, that she had these kinds of conditions and she just wasn't treated for them. Uh, instead, she was chained to a fence and raped repeatedly by various men in Abkhazia. So um, it's just a really sad story that her life had to go this way. She's got a slightly above average odds for type 2 diabetes. She's got a slightly above average odds for Alzheimer's. She's got a below average odds for multiple sclerosis. So the scores that he, the things he, she scores high for are DVT, deep vein thrombosis, and bipolar type 1 and schizophrenia. Right. Uh, multiple sclerosis, she scores low. For cancer section, one risk variant for breast cancer of 22, pretty good. Nine risk variants for testicular cancer of 24, pretty good. One risk variant for celiac disease out of 12, pretty good. No risk variants for GSS out of 18, pretty good. Six risk variants for Crohn's out of 26, pretty good. No risk variants for Reifenstein's out of 26, pretty good. And nine risk variants for Parkinson's out of 46, 
which is kind of bad, really, really, really awful. Uh, so she has um, increased risk for Parkinson's, increased risk for um, schizophrenia, bipolar, and bipolar type 1, and uh, deep vein thrombosis. Deep vein thrombosis is essentially like blood clots. When you get blood clots, and um, she's got a much higher predisposition to developing these blood clots. Let's go ahead and check her monogenic traits, and let's see what she scores for that. So it looks like she's got warrior genotype in COMT, so she's uh, got lower activity of the COMT enzyme, therefore uh, higher dopamine levels. It looks like she's got in TG, uh, heterozygous genotype in aspiration of MAOA, which means intermediate activity of the MAOA enzyme and intermediate rate of dopamine breakdown. So she's more of a warrior than a warrior, and she also has a predisposition to higher number of dopamine D2 receptor sites in the brain. So this right here is uh is really is really evidence of the, the she likely it is possible that she had schizophrenia it's really possible because a uh, higher number of dopamine d2 receptor sites it's a very schizophrenia condition like thing that predisposes somebody to schizophrenia and also she's got what a genotype in comb so there is not only more dopamine d2 receptor sites there's also more dopamine in the system as well so that together although this 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 these variations don't contribute to the uh, at least this variation and this variation, they don't contribute to the risk score for schizophrenia in the polygenic um, in the polygenic traits panel uh, because I didn't find like um, I guess I didn't find enough backing research supporting the theory that they would contribute to schizophrenia. But just looking at this and using my own theory, my own um, knowledge on the way this works, I think that it probably does have an effect, and in, it probably did contribute to whatever mental illness it is that she had. Um, which I think is was a psychotic illness. I, I ser seriously, maybe you think something different. Maybe you have a different idea than me. Maybe you think she had something else, but I think she had psychotic illness. That's what I think based on what I've read in this um, in this story in this story right here. And it looks like she also has short form five HTTLPR and higher risk of depression. Pretty typical stuff uh, for autism. <laughs> It looks like she's got some genotypes for higher risk of autism and one genotype for lower risk of autism. But I don't think she had autism because autism is not something that makes you um is not something that makes you tear clothing and walk around naked. So I don't think it's autism in her case, not at all. Um for lactose persistence, it looks like she does not carry the European lactose persistence mutation, doesn't have lactose persistence for OXTR. And the empathy gene, it looks like she's got a predisposition to higher empathy rather than lower. So she most likely has slightly higher empathy. Um, diabetes, we don't really care. Hemochromatosis, no risk variance for hemochromatosis. Really good to see. Uh, for Alzheimer's, it looks like she does not have any risk alleles for Alzheimer's in APOE. That's once again really good to see. Um, okay, wait a second. That's really cool. Hold on. So she's got these... Um, She's got these three genotypes, and they all contribute to higher risk for PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome. And I think I want to look that up. What is PCOS exactly? Hold on. It might be relevant, actually. Uh, so polycystic ovary syndrome is a problem with hormones that happens during the reproductive years. If you have PCOS, you might not have periods very often. Uh, okay. I wonder if this has to do with her appearance, actually, with the way she looked. Would it uh, would it cause somebody to be really tall and really hairy? Drop that in the comments. If you think PCOS might cause somebody to be really tall and hairy, you should drop that in the in the comments for sure. Uh, actually, I want to look at the I want to look at the uh, sex hormone panel as well. Let's see. So she's got higher levels of testosterone. She's got uh, lower levels of sex hormone blinding global globulin. Okay, she's got slightly lower than average levels of estradiol. Decreased level of estradiol. And lower levels of estradiol, so she's got a bit less, um, a bit less estrogen and a little, a little bit more testosterone. So this might have something to do with her appearance because um, her appearance is certainly very unusual, having so much, so much hair and uh, so much hair that people actually perceived her as a, uh, as an ape. I'm not sure. It might. It probably has something to do with the hormones. So I'm looking at the genotypes here. So she does not have any genotypes that would reduce the risk of PCOS, and she does not have any genotypes which which would decrease. I mean, increase the risk, the amount of estradiol. So once again, based on these genotypes right here, I'm just gonna make an assumption that it probably has something to do with her hormones, her appearance. 
her um, ridiculous like ape-like appearance probably had something to do with hormonal issues. Uh, just what I think, from what I think. Okay, for multiple sclerosis, no risk variance for that, except for this one. So no, no risk variance for multiple sclerosis in the HLA gene, which is by far the most important gene for that. For cardiovascular, we're going to skip that. For myopia panel, it looks like she does not ha really have the GLEO here, which would protect her myopia. This is the most important variation for myopia risk. So not having the GLEO here means she is a little bit more predisposed to myopia than average. Uh, for telomere gene, for telomere panel, it looks like she's got a reduction in, in the, the telomere length. So she's older, her biological age is older than individuals with CC here. All right, so she's predisposed to have a shorter lifespan. For vitiligo panel, she actually has a risk variance for vitiligo in the HLA gene, which is definitely very interesting. Um, so maybe the red hair that people were seeing, maybe it is a part of the vitiligo. Maybe she had a couple strands of red hair due to vitiligo. I don't know. Uh, let's see what she scores for vitiligo. Let's scroll up a little bit and see for that. Hold on. Vitiligo. What, what? So 1.5 times the average for vitiligo. No, I don't. It's kind of unlikely. No, I don't think she had vitiligo. It's, it would be kind of improbable for her to have that. Uh, no micropenis. No micropenis. Well, that's really obvious because she's a female. And for EDAR, she does not have East Asian genotype in EDAR. She's got she's got uh, West Eurasian or African genotype in EDAR. Uh, she's got this gene type, which leads to decreased odds of protruding nasal bridge, more upturned nose. So she's got more of an upturned nose. She's got shorter mid face length. She's got intermediate no nose size. She's got likely higher nasolabial angle, which means no nose pointing up based on her genotype in DCHS2. Uh, thicker eyebrows and slightly thicker eyebrows. So she has, she has, she's got thicker eyebrows and she's got uh, upward pointing nose. Upward pointing nose, and you know, I, I cannot sort of understand why people would think she's an ape, like with these kinds of traits. Um, I also noticed that upward pointing noses, like noses that point up, like snub noses, kind of like that, they kind of remind me of apes a little bit myself. But uh, of course, the, the whole morphology of the, of the skull in apes is completely different. They don't even have like a nose bridge. So... Obviously, there is a slight res resemblance, but it's not like you can obviously di distinguish a human with an upward pointing nose from an ape. It's pretty pretty easy to distinguish that. Um, it looks like she's got average or common common likelihood of um, hypersensitivity, but she does have one risk variant for pain hypersensitivity. That's very interesting. Uh, for sex hormone panel, we've seen that already. Uh, for albinism in a typical trace panel. Let's see about the albinism. So she is not a carrier of any of the albinism mutations. She does not have any, any risk variance for albinism. Really good to see. And she's also not a carrier for Melanesian blonde hair variants. She's also, she's got heterozygous gene type here, which leads to slight increase in the risk of cleft lip, but it's a slight increase. And she's not a carrier for Melanesian blonde hair variants. For familiar Mediter Mediterranean fever, she does not have any risk variance for that, uh, which is not surprising because she's black and and black people don't really have predispositions to familiar Mediterranean fever. Uh, for cancer spanel, um, she's got she's got some really good genotypes for testicular cancer. She's got six times reduced risk of testicular cancer. She's got nine times risk, reduced risk of testicular cancer. And then another genotype which corresponds to reduced testicular cancer risk for men. Uh, all of these three are located in the Kittel G gene. So she's she's got a predisposition to below average odds of testicular cancer, which is very typical for non-Europeans. Okay, wait. Look what I found here. Look what I found here for the rare diseases and traits panel. This is this is so bizarre. So she's got one holo holoprocephaly free risk variant and SSH free. You know what that is? Do you know what that is? Do you want me to look it up and show you? Let me show you what that is. Hold on. So she's got a risk variant for that. She's got a risk variant for that, bro. Like for yo, that's crazy. That is crazy. I did not think I would see that in uh, in a DNA file. That is so that is so crazy. I'm glad I added this to my trade predictor. I I swear I added it like uh, a week ago. I'm glad I did that because that's crazy. So that's basically a condition where the brain doesn't split into two parts, and because of that, the baby ends up like being born com severely 
severely like um, messed up physically and and in every way, and they typically don't survive past like two days or something after birth. So uh, she's got the Cyclopia risk variants in SSH. SSH stands for Sonic the Hedgehog gene. I'm not sure why they named it that. Why is it called Sonic the Hedgehog? It's such like a, it's such a funny, light-hearted name for such a brutal condition for a gene that's re related to such a brutal condition. I don't know. It's just funny. But she's got a risk variant for holopronencephaly. Wow, really crazy. Let's see what other uncommon risk variants she has. Uh, not, a, not a carrier for San Filippo syndrome risk. All right, not a carrier for Bloom syndrome. Um, nothing else. No, she doesn't really have any. Uh, she doesn't really carry any risk variants for anything. But she has AG here, which is really uncommon and leads to a significant reduction in the risk for certain autoimmune diseases. So she's a little bit protected from autoimmune diseases. So we remember vitiligo. Uh, in her case, she's probably good for that. All right, for celiac disease panel, somewhat increased risk of autoimmune disorder based on her genotype in HLA, but we know that she's got this genotype, which leads to a reduction in the risk of autoimmune diseases, so we don't have to worry about that too much. Um, for androgen receptor gene AR, AR panel, she has this genotype, which prevents her from going bold, and she does not have Reifenstein syndrome. For Crohn's disease, she does not have any risk variance for that. For Kahneman syndrome panel, no risk variance for that. For HIV and AIDS panel, no, no protective variance from HIV. For muscular dystrophy, my, dystrophy myopathy, she's got five risk variants for ADL, and she's got a couple of risk variants for muscular dystrophy myopathy here and here. Right, so five risk variants for ADL is kind of crazy. And at this point, you can't really, you can't really chalk that up to, um, you cannot really chalk that up to missed calls because you would not have five missed calls in one file out of 46. That's just really un unlikely. So, her her results are just really really messed up like it's it's really it's really concerning looking at this actually like it, it's and uh, ADL is something that only boys develop like if you're if you're a female you need to have um homozygous calls to develop ADL in her case she has five risk variants so we already know it's an it's an odd number so there is no homozygous calls it's heterozy heterozygous calls um so it's really a 50/50 chance if she had a male child if her male child would develop ADL, or if her male child would not would not get it, I think Hwit. Let's see Hwit here for right Hwit right Hwit right here. Uh, he survived to an old age, so for him, he probably did not get the risk variance for ADL. So good for him. He really dodged the bullet because there was a fifty percent chance that he would get get the risk variance for that from his mom. Wow. Okay. Actually, no. There wasn't a fifty percent chance because the risk variance would have come from um, would have come from Zana's um, dad. So yeah, there was no chance. So I guess he really dodged the bullet. But Zana herself had risk variance for ADL. Very interesting. For color blindness panel, it looks like no risk variance for color blindness in, in OPN1 LW, OPN1 MW, or OPN1 SW genes. For FTO gene panel, it looks like she's got some genotypes for actually no genotypes, no fat gene variance at all, no predisposition to obesity at all. Uh, for syncope panel, based on seven SNPs, she's got a slightly below average odds for syncope. For bio trades panel, she's got two copies of the hunter gatherer CLTCL1 gene variant, reduced ability to process carbs and sugars. Definitely very interesting. Um, wet earwax, normal or smellier body odor, normal colostrum, typ typical for non East Asians. All right. She's got normal earwax, normal body odor. Um, okay, let's see what else. What else is there? that I can talk about here. Um, and for blood group panel, it looks like her blood type is AB. Wow, that's crazy. So this this genome is just like riddled with mysteries and crazy things. Uh, I could generate so much content about this, but I don't really know what to say because type AB is really uncommon. There is, it's not really found anywhere. Like you don't, that's crazy, man. So holo, there, I mean, I don't even know what to talk about exactly in this in this result. There's uh there's just so much content. Wow, so she's got type AB blood type. Wow, that's crazy. Type AB. 70 72% likelihood of type AB, 27% likelihood of type B. Most likely she's got type AB blood type. All right. Wow. Well, thanks for watching this video until the very end. 
Uh, it was definitely very interesting for me to make, uh, exploring her DNA result. Uh, tomorrow, or maybe after tomorrow, depending on how I feel, I will be making a video on her son, Hvit, because I also have his result. Uh, her DNA file will be in the uh, link, which is in the description of the video. And of course, leave a like and subscribe if you enjoy my content. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.